Oh, hi, welcome in. We'll make this intro quick because I'm sure it'll be a long one. My name is Justin. I greatly appreciate all the love that was given on the last video, and I hope that you guys continue to enjoy the content that I'm making. The new year means new avenues for content, so if you want to join this journey, you can go ahead and subscribe if you'd like to. And uh, with all that said, let's just go ahead and get into it. Nancy Drew has been an integral part of my life growing up, and I'm sure that it has been for a lot of other people. I have played all the games except for the first two due to accessibility reasons, so we have a tier for those specifically. Secrets Can Kill is the first game in the series released on November 15th, 1998. It follows Nancy as she tries to track down the murderer at a local high school in Florida named Pasio Del Mar that her aunt works at as a librarian. I will say there's a certain amount of charm to this one due to this age with the characters being drawn in 2D form, a form we won't see from the game line past this point. And I'd like to include that they made a remake for the game that released on August 24, 2010 due to incompatibility of the older games on newer hardware. I haven't played either of these games, but the remake brings a fresh coat of paint with a different ending to the game and 3D models for the characters. All in all, a good start to the series, and I definitely anticipate playing it. Stay tuned for Danger is the second game in the franchise and was released on November 13th, 1999. This game follows Nancy being invited to NYC to stay with Maddie Jensen, the star of a popular soap opera known as Light of Our Love. After hearing about her success at Paseo Del Mar High School, Maddie is hoping that Nancy will be able to solve this case and get to the bottom of who is threatening another actor on set known as Rick Arlen. This game was the first to introduce us to the 3D models we know and love. Like I said, I haven't been able to play this one in the past, sadly, but hope to get to it soon. Despite not playing these titles, I do have an immense respect and love for these games, being the kickoff to a formula that I myself have grown to love. Message in a Haunted Mansion is the third game in the series, released on November 24th, 2000, and is one that I've actually played fairly recently. This one follows Nancy as she travels to the good old San Fran to help her housekeeper's friend, Rose Green, with converting a Victorian mansion into a bed and breakfast. The presence of the supernatural begins to come into question when terrible accidents begin happening around the estate, such as fires, gas leaks, and the collapsing of scaffoldings. It's your job to figure out who in the mansion would gain the most out of the situation at hand and bring them to justice. Personally, this game was amazing in almost every regard. This is one of the games that really captivated me with the setting and information available to learn. Learning about Victorian mansions and their relations with San Francisco was extremely interesting and even taught me a bit about the Great Earthquake of 1906. Most of the characters in this game were very interesting to talk to and I never really got tripped up on what I should be doing next. Later on you'll see that sometimes you just get lost in the games and can't progress just because you didn't click on a specific item or talk to somebody about a certain thing, but I feel like this wasn't very present in this one. Many spooky sounds can be heard while walking through the halls of the mansion and you can even see paintings or statues blink at you if you pay enough attention. All in all, amazing setting and truly one that is worth playing even in today's time. I'm going to have to give that one probably about an A. We'll put it at A. Moving on to the fourth game of the series, Treasure in the Royal Tower, a snowy adventure set in Wisconsin at the Wickford Castle Ski Resort. This one was released on August 1st, 2001 and received a Gold Parents' Choice Award in the fall of 2001. Vandalizations and burglaries are being committed at the Snowden Castle and you must race against the perpetrator to find the treasure hidden in Marie Antoinette's tower that was rebuilt from the Chateau Ro Romont in France. I think I said that right. I don't know. Chateau Rochemont. Being a castle is filled with many hidden rooms and puzzles that lead you towards a treasure that Marie tried her best to hide. This is one of the first Nancy Drew games that I actually played, and I remember being swooped up in the grandeur of it all. Uh, many of the characters are memorable, and the setting is not one to scoff at with beautiful scenes of huge libraries and secret gardens. I personally don't remember most of the puzzles, and when looking back at walkthroughs, I think I understand why. These puzzles definitely required note-taking throughout your experience and are a bit heftier than the puzzles presented in the third game. All in all, this is one that makes you feel right there with Nancy in the long winding corridors of the castle and is definitely higher up on the list. This game also introduces us to the eccentric scholar Beatrice Hotchkiss, who we will see pop up in later games. Uh, this is a very strong title for sure. We'll put it at about B. The fifth game in the series is The Final Scene, a dramatic adventure within the Royal Palladium Theater in St. Louis, Missouri. Nancy is here with her friend Maya Wynn for the premiere of Vanishing Destiny, starring Brady Armstrong. Maya is supposed to be interviewing Brady for the, her school's newspaper, and as she enters his dressing room, she is kidnapped and held somewhere in the theater that is set to be demolished in three days. Suddenly, Nancy is thrown onto a case to save her friend and uncover whoever was behind the kidnapping. 
all on a three days time limit. This game is very enjoyable in my opinion, and the stakes feel much higher than any of the games before it. The theater and its owner is rich with history as you begin to find secrets that revolve around Harry Houdini. The puzzles are much simpler in this game though compared to the fourth game with sliding puzzles and rotating jigsaws. Uh, this kind of hinders the game's length a bit due to most of the actual gameplay being focused more on conversations and scenic areas versus actual puzzles. Even as a kid, I didn't really have to use a walkthrough, so take that how you will if you're an adult who enjoys Nancy Drew or is looking to get into Nancy Drew. Um, it's good for what it is. A strong title all around with a bit of a low runtime. We'll put that about... We'll put that B. Secret of the Scarlet Hand is a sixth game in the franchise, released on August 12th, 2002, and follows Nancy as she takes an internship at the Beach Hill Museum in Washington, D.C. This museum focuses mainly on Mayan culture and is preparing an exhibit for a newly discovered monolith. Just before the opening of this exhibit, a jade carving of Pakal is stolen from the museum and the culprit left nothing behind except for a red handprint. Nancy must find this stolen piece and help save the museum from going under financially due to the loss. No taking is a necessity in this one and delves pretty deep into Mayan culture and mythology if that's something that interests you. The characters are pretty memorable, each with quirks of their own, but the setting isn't really anything to write home about. I know it's a museum, so it'll feel a bit staged and closed in, but I feel like there weren't as many set pieces as previous games leading up to this one. The Mayan facts are very interesting to learn about, but I'd be lying if I said I remembered most, if any, of it. Um, this one actually features some more mainstays of the series, such as the Hardy Boys being able to be someone you can call. Uh, a trailer at the end of the game for the next one, as well as Krollmeister being name dropped as a brand and we'll definitely see him later on. These are all things that will be in the games moving forward. Secret of the Scarlet Hand came out to do what it's meant to do and not much else other than that. For that reason I'm going to be putting it probably like lower B, maybe C, who knows. At this point in the series, I feel as though Herner Interactive really found its footing as to what they wanted the games to be. They realized that having a very distinct setting and tone is what's going to make these games stand out and boy did they accomplish that with Ghost Dogs of Moon Lake. This is the seventh game in the franchise, released on November 1st, 2002 and is set in Moon Lake, Pennsylvania. Nancy's friend Sally McDonald recently purchased a house on the lake whose former owner was a Prohibition era gangster named Mickey Malone and invites Nancy to come out but is missing when Nancy arrives. Sally was forced to leave in the middle of the night when a pack of four seemingly ghost dogs attack the house. Nancy has once again fallen into a case to figure out who is coordinating these attacks against Sally and if there is more than meets the glowing eyes of these ghost dogs. <laughs> okay, I wrote this script like six hours ago. I'm very, very tired now, so it sounds very weird to me. We'll just try and take that take seriously. <clears throat> <laughs> and if there's more than meets the glowing eyes of these ghost dogs. As I stated earlier, Her Interactive really understands what they want out of these games and delivers an amazing setting that has us walking through misty woods at night, uh, unearthing forgotten speakeasies, and even following cave systems to figure out who's behind everything. I truly feel like this is one of the peak Nancy Drew games and is one I try to get people to play if they've never tried anything Nancy related in the past. I love the charm of the setting and find the story nonsensical enough to be very, very investing because it's one of the first times in the series that it's a bit more out there compared to what we've seen so far. The music is memorable and gives me that potent dose of nostalgia every time I hear it. The dogs are a standout and make you feel like they could come and attack at any time. This game also features three characters which means that you get to know them a lot better and kind of shrouds it in more mystery considering that it's such a tight knit cast. I can sing the praises of this game for a while but I do have to admit that the puzzles aren't much in regards to what we've seen. Uh, one of them is literally just reading roman numerals to file away manilas so that gives you an idea of what you're working with. But even with puzzles that aren't incredibly engaging, there's still a lot to get from this one. While avoiding spoilers, there's a scene near the middle of the game involving a shed fire that keeps you back on your toes if you start to feel a little bit lost. In my humble opinion, this is a very, very good game, and those are very, very good boys. We'll give that an S. Following a spooky tone still, The Haunted Carousel is the eighth game in the line, released on August 22nd. 2003 and brings us out to the Jersey Shore. Well, not exactly like that. We arrive at the Captain Cove's amusement park where Nancy is invited to investigate mysterious happenings around the park. 
The lead horse of the park's carousel is stolen. Coasters are randomly losing power, and the carousel itself is starting up in the middle of the night. It's up to Nancy to track down the stolen horse and understand its relations to the other happenings around the park. After such a grand slam as Ghost Dogs, the Haunted Carousel kind of takes a bit more of a backseat when it comes to things like setting or even atmosphere. Not saying it's bad by any means, but most of the set pieces are just places in the park that look a bit samey all around. There are a few sites in this game that are very grand and beautiful, but after the free feeling of Ghost Dogs, it's hard to bring set pieces alive in a park, you know? A few of the characters are memorable in this one, and some can be replaced by pretty much anyone. The puzzles in this one also take a bit of a backseat, with there being a few midway games that gets considered as puzzles, and having to solve riddles to a talking robot. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a thing. It's definitely worth playing, but doesn't really scratch that itch that I'm looking for when I play Nancy Drew games. We'll put that about B. Maybe. The ninth game is Danger on Deception Island, released on October 3rd, 2003. Nancy is invited by a friend of a friend out to Washington State for a well washing. Well washing. <laughs> Working at the well wash. Hey. Hey. Nancy is invited by a friend of a friend out to Washington State for a well watching excursion. There you go, that's how you say it. And has once again fallen into a case. Upon arriving, Katie Firestone's tour boat has been vandalized to an extreme degree and has left a note telling her to stop meddling. This note is in regards to Katie's comments made to the residents of the harbor as to what should happen to an orphaned orca whale that appeared in the channel. It is now thrust onto Nancy to find the vandal and during her search, she uncovers many secrets that's been plaguing Deception Island for years and years. This is one that brings us back to our grand slam in terms of the setting and story. I guess it truly is something about the doom and gloom environments that really just does it for me, I don't know. I remember almost all the settings and characters and really enjoyed venturing through underground caves and maze-like tunnels. The puzzles are back to the forefront with this game as well, with many small puzzles all throughout. Puzzles in this one include learning maritime signal flags, navigating treacherous waters, and even learning about well calls and skeletons. I believe that a puzzle forcing you to actually learn something beats a jigsaw like any day of the week. I don't really remember the music all too well for this one, and looking back it is a bit drab with a lot of gongs and gloomy sounds. This definitely was another great addition to the game line and is one worth playing. We will put that... we'll put that lower A. Dang old secret shadow ranch, man. Oh wait, this is for the costume change. I don't have a cowboy hat, so just act like this is a cowboy hat, please. Secret of Shadow Ranch, <laughs> released August 30th, 2004, is set in good old Arizona on the Shadow Ranch. Nancy has been invited by the owners Ed and Bet Raleigh to come out for a vacation, but are missing upon arrival. You find out Ed has been bit by a rattlesnake and both of them are staying at the hospital for the game's runtime. A phantom glowing horse appeared galloping on the horizon right before this, and many other disturbances on the ranch. Is the ranch itself haunted by the ghost horse, or is there foul play at hand? I just want to take a minute and say that this is genuinely one of my favorite Nancy Drew games. I will try and reserve my biases, but there is truly just something about this one that makes me adore it. The setting, the music, the puzzles, the things there are to learn, etc, etc. This one just hits the nail right on the head for me. I love the voice acting from the characters on the ranch. I love learning more about Arizona and the horses on the ranch. I love how free it felt in the world considering we could go horseback riding to pretty much anywhere on the map. Uh, you eventually even stumble upon a ghost town. So, uh, I mean, what more could you want? There's a ghost town, what more could you want? The scenes are beautiful with magnificent rock structures, and you can even chop wood. Look, you can chop wood. Isn't that pretty cool? It's triple A, I'm telling you. This is the first one to also introduce a UI change, which looks pretty sleek. Ooh. You can die to a lot of stuff or get fired pretty easy, so you gotta figure out what you did wrong and do it right. It is a very good game with very memorable characters and one I definitely recommend to people who want to try the series out. S for sure. The Curse of Blackmore Manor is the 11th game in the series and is the first one to be set outside of the US. It was released on October 5th, 2004 and takes place in England. 
You've been invited out by Linda Penvalen's mother to figure out what exactly has her hiding behind a canopy all day in bed acting extremely erratically. Upon talking to her further, you begin to suspect that she believes she is turning into a lycanthrope of some sort. After investigating many parts of the manor, you realize that there is more than meets the eye. This one is a very good one in my opinion and has its own charm being set in a very uppity English manor. The cast of characters are very memorable and there are many set pieces to see in the game. It does kind of fall into the same ballpark as Haunted Carousel in terms of everything looking very samey. But I do enjoy this one a bit more than Haunted Carousel in those regards. We'll also meet Lulu the parrot in this game who helps by giving hints. I know it may seem strange to bring the parrot up but trust me it comes back later so just keep him in mind. The puzzles take a bit of a backseat and most of the learning in the game revolves around the fictional Penvalen family unless I'm not remembering something but I played it fairly recently. All in all this is a good one and very distinct for what it is. We will put that high A. So the 12th game is Secret of the Old Clock and is a bit different from any of the games before it. It was released July 12th, 2005 and is actually set in the 1930s at the beginning of the Great Depression. We arrive in the fictional town of Titusville, Illinois, where Nancy's been asked to come see Emily Crandall, whose mom died a month earlier. Emily had been anticipating her strange neighbor Josiah Crowley to leave part of his estate in his will to help take care of the inn that they own but he left everything to one of his teachers of ESP. As Nancy digs deeper, she begins to realize that this case involves things such as stolen jewels, car chases, and even a missing will. So this game was to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Nancy Drew and was based off the first four books of the series. Uh, because of that and being set in the 30s, there's really not much to say about it in all honesty. I don't really remember the characters all too well. The puzzles are also a bit more childish, if I'm gonna be honest, and the whole tone is just a bit muddled. I can appreciate and respect it for what it is, but it's really not too much of a standout in my opinion. The stakes really just aren't there, so I'm gonna have to put it a bit lower. We'll say, um, we'll say D. Game 13 ropes us back in with another really good one. Uh, Last Train to Blue Moon Canyon was released on September 15, 2005 and follows Nancy as she's invited onto the train with Frank and Joe Hardy to try to search for Jake Hurley's mine. Lori Gerard is a socialite who has invited the Hardys and many other faces to help her search on a train that's haunted by Hurley's wife. This one ticks all the boxes that make me really love these games. Uh, eccentric characters, strong mysterious setting, strong puzzles, and an all-around tone of not knowing what's going to happen next. The characters are all memorable and the voice acting is really great in this one. The puzzles are pretty good and actually introduces a puzzle that will last throughout most of the game. So that really makes you feel like you're working towards something greater. Uh, for most of the game you're on a train and it feels like the whole game may take place on the train but you actually disembark which is pretty cool as well. Uh, this is also the first time we meet the Hardy Boys in game. This one really does it for me. We will give this... let's give it a low A. Taking a quick intermission, let's take a moment to talk about the music of Nancy Drew. The tone of many of these games are made or broke by the music that you hear while you're uncovering the mysteries laid before you. I wanted to take a moment to talk about the soundtracks of some of the games that we've already talked about and how it makes it memorable. The first two tracks that I'd like to point out are from Message in Haunted Mansion. Chinese is very solemn with many rises and falls and strikes a very mysterious feeling in you. The same can be said for Entry. Both really strike a good tone for Message in a Haunted Mansion. Another one to point out is Dressing from the final scene. It keeps shifting between these ethereal drones in the background while a very light jig is played on top. Perfect for that feeling that like something just isn't quite right, you know? Forest from Ghost Dogs and Moon Lake hits the exact same feeling with violin strings being pushed to the limit in the background and a bit of a more cheery tone on top. Moon from Ghost Dogs is also what you'll hear throughout most of the game and begins with an almost country feeling harp and ends up crescendoing into something much much more grand.
Miles the Magnificent Memory Machine also has a theme song. Hit it, Miles. Explore from Last Train to Blue Moon Canyon also just hits in its own right. I could go on, but we'd be here a while after we went through all the games, so let's get back to the ranking. Game 14 has us flying out to a fashion studio in Paris, France. Uh, Danger by Design was released on July 24th, 2006, and has Nancy working undercover as an intern to figure out why the lead designer, Manette, hasn't been herself. Chantrums have been almost constant, with her throwing multiple heavy objects and firing employees irrationally, all while hiding behind a mysterious white mask. Threats begin appearing to the studio, and upon searching deeper, you come to find an old wartime plot by a French revolutionary who stole many valuable pieces of art to save during World War II. We also get to see Nancy's desk for the first time. Woo! Nice. This is another pretty good one for me. Many of the characters are memorable. I love the setting being in Paris, and there are many things to learn about from this game. Uh, the puzzles are a bit lackluster in this one, though. Things like tea brewing, matching games, and um, painting? That's a puzzle. The puzzles doesn't really hinder it an incredible amount, and it's still one that's really worth playing. We will put that, we'll put that top of B. Number 15. So, uh, Creature of the Kapu Cave is not really that great of a game. There are definitely parts to it that are good, but the overall experience is not something to write home about. Creature of Kapu Cave was released on October 1st, 2006, and follows Nancy as she goes to Hawaii to be a research assistant for Dr. Quigley Kim, who's researching a scourge, a scourge, a scourge, a scourge, how do you say it? Scourge? Scourge. Scourge. Researching a scourge that's destroying the pineapple crop. The camp has been ransacked upon arrival. Dr. Kim is missing and a heavy storm knocks out the bridge that Nancy came in on, so she's stuck at the ransacked camp. The Hardy Boys are also in Hawaii for a, quote, top secret mission, end quote. So they all team up to figure out what's really going on. You can actually swap out and play as the Hardy Boys in this one, so that is pretty cool, I guess. In all actuality though, not trying to fly through anything, I feel like I could beat this game in 3, maybe 4 hours tops. Uh, this is a criminally short game with hardly any puzzles that make you feel like you've figured something out. This is spoiler free so I won't touch on it too much, but the ending also doesn't feel very satisfying. If anything, this is more of a minigame collection if you want it to be that. Making shaved ice, collecting shells for necklaces, and fishing are probably going to be the only fun you get out of this one. I may be a bit harsh on it, but after multiple playthroughs, I still feel how I feel about it, you know? I guess we'll put that low C, high D, depending on how the rest of this goes, because it's really not as bad as the newer Nancy Drew games, but it is still kind of a rough game, especially for how early everything was at this point. The White Wolf of Icicle Creek is the 16th game released on June 7th, 2007. This game brings us right back to formula and also provides us with another UI change going forward. This one follows Nancy as she travels to Alberta, Canada, being invited by the owner Chantel to investigate a string of strange accidents that have been occurring around the lodge. A white wolf appears at the scene of each of these accidents and seems to be an omen of bad tidings. It's up to Nancy to find out what's going on before all the guests leave out of fear. We are back hitting all the points that make me love this series. Amazing set pieces, great puzzles, memorable characters, and a sense of freedom. I've played this game the most out of probably any of them and still find love for it. This game is also the origin of the uh, I fired and I missed meme from the Game Grumps. So I fired again. And I missed, and then I missed again, and, and again. then I fired again, <laughs> and then I missed, and then I fired, and then I fired, and I missed. I missed both times, and then I fired, and I missed. It was from when they were playing the Wii version. With the bombastic climax and ending, I have to say this is a uh, peak Nancy Drew. This is peak Nancy Drew. We're gonna go ahead and throw that up at S. Next up on the list, we have Legend of the Crystal Skull. Eh. Eh, I know. Released on October 8th, 2007. This is the 17th game in the series and has Nancy staying in New Orleans while on vacation with her friend Bess. 
Also, side note, throughout most of these games, Bess and George are available to call and ask for hints, so seeing her and eventually playing as her is really cool in its own right. While in New Orleans, Nancy goes to visit Henry Bollet Jr. to check up on him after the death of his uncle. Henry is Ned's friend, and upon arriving, Nancy is knocked out with a powder substance by a man in a skull mask. Once awakened, a terrible storm keeps Nancy trapped at the estate, so her and Bess work together to figure out the mystery of the Crystal Skull. Again, her interactive had done really well with the world building and makes a genuinely unsettling environment for Nancy to investigate in. With memorable characters, beautiful set pieces such as cemeteries and graveyards, and pretty strong puzzles, this game knew what it wanted to do and just did it. This one also had another puzzle in the works like Last Train to Blue Moon Canyon did, so that was very interesting to see unfold as well. This is one of those that just stick out to me just because of the charm. Very good in my opinion. We'll put that low A. The Phantom of Venice. Ooh. This is the 18th game and was released on July 11th, 2008. So uh, stick with me while I explain this one. A masked thief, who residents have begun referring to as the Phantom, has been terrorizing the open markets of Venice Carnivale. Due to the amount stolen and the months of investigations that has led to nothing, the Italian secret police has contacted Nancy to go undercover and take down an underground crime syndicate. So without having to say it, uh, the scopes of these games are becoming bigger and bigger. Being in Venice, the setting throughout most of the game is absolutely beautiful. The characters are memorable and eccentric and there's a decent mystery to solve. Uh, the puzzles aren't very grand in this one, but there are some standouts like playing Scopa, which is still something that I say every once in a while to this day. Also, uh, this. Yes. Oh wow, she's hitting it. This is a very interesting one and is good in its own right. We will put it high B. Next up, we have game 19, The Haunting of Castle Malloy. This was released on October 16th, 2008, and follows Nancy to good old Ireland. Her friend Kyler Malloy has invited her out to her wedding with Matt Simmons, who has suddenly went missing. Is it cold feet or something a bit more sinister like the ghostly apparition that appeared on the road causing Nancy to crash in the ditch? It's up to Nancy to unravel the secrets of the castle and even the estate itself to find out where Matt has gone. This game is also a bit larger in scope with many cinematic shots throughout the game of the ghostly apparition. Bit of a spoiler, but to show you what I mean, uh, you literally have to build a rocket at the end of the game. The setting is very enjoyable and eerie, and having less of a cast of characters again helps with memorability. The puzzles are also back to being actually puzzling, and the climax and ending are well worth the wait. All around a very good game in the series, we'll put it low A. Boom, another costume change. We're talking about an island, so I have on my Hawaiian shirt. Wow, he's so creative. He's a content creator. Ransom of the Seven Ships was released on July 14th, 2009, and centers on Bess being kidnapped and held for ransom after she wins a trip to the Bahamas. It's up to Nancy and George to find the hidden treasure and save Bess. Uh, so there's a few positives about this game, but honestly, there is a lot of negatives. This game is bright and cheery and offers a very nice island setting. Uh, you can drive anywhere on the island with a golf cart and you meet a pack of monkeys who you can end up playing mini games with. Uh, there's a decent amount to learn from this game, which is also fun, but um, the main antagonist is a white guy who poses as Jamaican for most of the game. My name is Johnny Roll. I have come here to fish and- <laughs> Sorry, I guess, for saying that this was spoiler free, but the game was discontinued and pulled off both Steam and her interactive in July of 2020. So there's that. Even without the racial insensitivity, there's still not much to get out of this game. Hey, so I forgot to mention it, but um, Cuckoo the Parrot appears in this game uh, and is the granddaughter of Lulu the Parrot from The Curse of Blackmore Manor. I thought that was pretty cute and worth pointing out, but I completely forgot to say it while I was recording. Um, you have to give the parrot treats for her to give hints, and that's kind of like her role in the game. So I thought that was pretty cute, and that's why I made a, a big deal earlier about like, remember Lulu, remember Lulu, and then I completely forgot to say it, so there you go. Uh, this is another short one with around 5-ish hours of gameplay, so because of all that, you are going to be put 
a little further down. We will put you in D. Game 21, released on October 12th, 2009, is Warnings at Waverly Academy. Nancy is asked to pose undercover as Becca Sawyer at an all-girls boarding school in upstate New York by the headmistress. Students in the run for valedictorian are beginning to receive threatening notes, and the people who get two typically have something happen to them, such as a severe allergic reaction or being locked inside a dark food closet all night. After digging deeper, Nancy discovers that someone may have hidden a treasure in the walls of the academy, and things start to make a bit more sense. The cast is okay in this one, with a few standouts, but being undercover means most of the puzzles involve doing busy work or doing homework for the other students. Uh, it felt a bit monotone throughout the story, but has a good enough climax and ending to still be enjoyable. Uh, nothing too crazy, so we will put that top of B. Trail of the Twister, the 22nd installment released on June 9th, 2010. Nancy has once again been asked to go undercover, this time as an intern with a storm chasing group in Oklahoma. A bunch of their equipment has been randomly malfunctioning just as they're in the running to receive a $100 million grant from the Green Skies Storm Competition. Is it bad luck or straight sabotage? Find out in next week's episode of Dragon Ball Z. This cast is definitely more memorable than some of the past games with people like Paw or Chase Relaford. The music is quite memorable in this one as well with very engaging puzzles throughout. Charlo the Twister rises a bit higher than the others. Uh, the setting really makes you feel like you could be in danger, and there are many climactic parts throughout. I'm not saying it's S tier by any means, but I honestly think about the ending of this game much more than the others, just because of how wild it ends up getting. Very good one. Uh, we will put it, we'll put it highest of B. Okay, so now here is a heavy hitter for you. Released on October 19th, 2010, Game 23, Shadow at the Water's Edge. Hate to break it to you so quickly, but S tier, S tier, S tier, S tier. Hella good game. Nancy travels to Kyoto, Japan uh, with her friends Bess and George to work as an English teacher, but upon arriving to her Ryokin, she finds out, she finds out, she finds out. But upon arriving to her Ryokin, she finds out that a supposed Yuri is haunting the, the guest. Can I just have a take? Can I have one take? Okay, let's just start it all the way over. How about that? We'll do that. Nancy travels to Kyoto, Japan with her friends Bess and George to work as an English teacher. But upon arriving to her Ryokin, she finds out that a supposed Yuri is haunting the guest and causing many to leave the Ryokin until it's just only Nancy there. Nancy being the way that she is, decides to solve the mystery of who's pretending to haunt the inn. This premise leads to many beautiful set pieces, very interesting and fun puzzles, and a very decent plot to see unfold. I will also be the first to say uh, that there is probably a lot of bias towards this game for me, but I genuinely love this one. Its story is engaging throughout. I want to actually talk to the characters and find out more about them, and the ending genuinely surprised me the first time around. The music also slaps. Nancy had to have been bussing it down in the metro. telling you man that's an s we're in the short rows now just hold on a tiny bit longer the captive curse is the 24th game in the series and was released on june 28th 2011 set in castle finster in germany this game follows nancy as she is asked by the castle's owner to investigate the legend of a monster who appears every few years to claim a victim typically being a young woman wearing a specific type of necklace is there truth to the legend, or is there something a bit darker going on? This one is okay, and as you'll probably see moving forward, this is one that I've played like once, and I've been okay with not touching again. The plot's serviceable, and the puzzles are decent enough. The settings are very pretty throughout the game, but there's just a lot of blandness when it comes to this one, and I'm honestly just not really sure what it is. Maybe I just need to try this one out again, but for now, we are going to put it low C. 
Alibi and Ashes is the 25th game of the series, and because of that, they wanted it to be a bit bombastic. Okay, so we want to make this one big. Start throwing ideas at me. L let's set it in River Heights. Oh, wow. Okay, go on. Go on. And, uh... Let's lock Nancy behind some bars. You're getting a raise. Get this man a raise. That's such a terrible skit, that's so stupid. So yeah, this was released on October 18th, 2011, and was a celebration of 25 games of Nancy. They decided they would shake it up by having Nancy be the prime suspect of an arson case in her hometown. You switch off between Nancy, Bess, and George throughout, and try and help Nancy prove her innocence. I don't really think I have to explain it, but uh, making your main character be locked to one location for most of the game is not very fun. And you have the ability to switch off characters, but it's a bit annoying and it's disappointing to say the least. I remember this game fairly well, but I don't think I would ever want to play it again. The setting is all very samey, puzzles are pretty good, and you have an evidence police board, but that's about it. Climax and conclusion both weren't anything to write home about. Best thing out of it was probably seeing Nancy Drew's house that she grew up in. Tomb of the Lost Queen is the 26th game, released on May 8th, 2012. Oh hey, we have another UI change. That's pretty cool. Nancy travels to a Kingston University archaeological dig site in Egypt where a lost tomb was discovered. It's found out that people have been attacked to try and explore the tomb, so people begin calling it cursed. Once again, we have a, another serviceable one that's not incredibly ambitious. The setting itself is amazing with many grand set pieces and an interesting enough story. Uh, there was a lot to learn about Egypt and most of the puzzles included hieroglyphs or the use of ciphers in general. This one was okay and one that I've played a few times in the past. I'll put it low B. The Deadly Device is the 27th installment and was released on October 23rd, 2012. Luckily, we're back with a much more interesting case in my opinion. The physicist Nico Jovic was found dead, seemingly electrocuted at a remote laboratory in Colorado known as Technology of Tomorrow Today. The lab's owner has asked you to go undercover to investigate the murder since Nico's work could sell for millions and foul play is suspected. Attempts on Nancy's life begin happening, so you have to race against a murderer to uncover them before they have the chance to get to you. Although you're stuck in a lab for most of the game's duration due to a snowstorm, the setting still feels very fun to explore. Uh, there are many grand sites to see and very interesting puzzles along the way. There's also many memorable characters to talk with throughout and many things to learn. Glad to see that Nancy had a return to form so late into the series. We'll put it low a ghost of thornton hall is a 28th game released on may 14th 2013. jessalyn thornton and her friend addison hammond decided to have a pre-wedding celebratory sleepover at thornton hall off the coast of georgia but their fun was cut short after jessalyn's disappearance thornton hall is known to be a bit of a supernatural hotspot, so nancy is called in as a skeptic to figure out what is really going down at Thornton Hall. While I do remember the game having insanely long conversations, it still is a pretty good one due to just the atmosphere alone. The scenes are all very pretty and even has a few actual jump scares throughout the game. The puzzles are definitely lacking if I remember correctly. Looking back through walkthroughs, it looks to be mostly finding the right item or solving a small code. But like I said, this one is good because of its story and characters in all honesty. A very serviceable one. We'll put that high B. So Nancy's mom is technically dead in the books and is not present in the games, but her interactive wanted to shake things up again and made a story about Nancy's mother being a spy? A spy? Up to this point, we believed that Kate Drew had died in a car accident when Nancy was younger, but uh, no. She died on a mission as a spy. Duh. So The Silent Spy is the 29th game in the series and was released on October 22nd, 2013. It's weird because the older that I got when the games were released, the less I remember them, honestly. Uh, this one had the Scottish government asking Nancy to come investigate the death of her mom due to her actually being a spy and neutralizing a biochemical weapon in Scotland a decade before. I really am trying to research, but wow, this plot is kind of wild. I barely remember any of the characters or the plot itself. 
it just seems to be almost fan fiction-y in a way. I'm not going to keep running it into the ground when I barely remember any of it, so we'll put it at C and move on. I guess I need to play this one through again sometime soon. Hey, uh, so I just checked the video to see how much time was recording, realized I was in 30 frames per second for the middle half of that. Uh, we're back to 60, sorry, and um, I'm going to finish the video wearing this because I'm very, very hot. The Shatter Medallion is the 30th game in the series and was released on May 20th, 2014. I'm going to sound very confused about this one because I am. Nancy and George end up winning a spot on the reality TV show Pacific Run. Uh, the show is a bit like The Amazing Race, I believe. Uh, I've never seen that show either. After a serious injury leaves George unable to compete, Bess decides to step in to be our showmate and figure out what is going on with production's requests becoming more and more dangerous. This game actually introduces us to Sunny June. Uh, who we see throughout most of the series as little easter eggs, and he is a part of the production crew causing these terrible decisions leading people to getting hurt. I played this game twice in the past, and reading back through walkthroughs of the game, I genuinely do not remember any of it, so I guess that goes to show you how good the game is. Everything seems to come out of left field, and these extremely large scopes for the game are just completely hindering it at this point. Uh, none of the puzzles were memorable, and everything is a bit convoluted. So for all those reasons, it is going a bit far down. I will say probably a D. I hate being mean. It hurts. Labyrinth of Lies is the 31st game of the series and was released on October 14th, 2014. Uh, Melina Rosi is a curator of the Phidias, Phidias Cultural Center in Greece and has hired Nancy to assist her with the play called Persephone in Winter, which is being put on to drum up publicity for a new ancient Greece exhibit. Costly artifacts begin disappearing from the exhibit and it's up to Nancy to get to the bottom of the thefts. I actually remember a fair amount of this one and it just falls into the same problem as many of the newer games. Uh, decent characters that aren't exceptionally memorable, puzzles that are serviceable but can be cracked in about 5 to 10 minutes. Uh, beautiful set designs, but just aren't really grounded in reality. Like, uh, that's that's under a stage. That's under, like, a play stage. Y'all just be getting fire under stages now? That's wild. Going back to the puzzles, there are a lot in this game. And like I said, they aren't very memorable. I don't like this quantity over quality that her interactive was going for. It's an okay game, but one that I don't think I'll be revisiting. Uh, this is going to be like low C. So the 32nd game can be considered somewhat uh, the last of the mainline Nancy Drew games for a couple of reasons. Uh, this is the last static point and click game and the last one before the garbage fire that is Midnight in Salem. The Nancy Drew formula kind of died with this game, uh, with the newest Nancy Drew game being in 3D on the Unity engine. So with heavy hearts, uh, let's take a look at game 32, Sea of Darkness. Uh, this game was released on May 19th, 2015, and follows Nancy as she travels to Iceland to figure out what happened to the crew of an Icelandic ship that was supposed to be restored for a festival, but came back entirely empty. This is definitely uh, the best of the later games, with an amazing atmosphere, interesting enough characters, and decent puzzles that actually held a bit of weight. Uh, the story is again a bit much for a Nancy Drew game, but for it to be the last of its kind, it's, it's pretty okay. I'll put it uh, low B. So, uh, Midnight in Salem. Let's get this over with. Midnight in Salem is the 33rd game in the Nancy Drew series, and it is one that most Nancy Drew fans do not like. As stated earlier, this game uses a Unity engine, meaning it's a first-person 3D adventure, uh, as opposed to the point-and-click style Nancy has been used to. It was released on December 3rd, 2019, and I didn't get the chance to play it till about a year after. This game follows Nancy as she travels to Salem, Massachusetts to investigate a case of arson. All of my personal qualms aside, uh, this is an okay game. It's okay. The plot's okay. The gameplay is okay. The length is okay. All of it is just okay, in my opinion. Uh, I believe most of the fans' reaction had to do with the fact that Lanny Minnelli was no longer the voice actress for Nancy, and Brittany Cox was hired on due to Lanny aging out, uh, which is something I do not personally agree with. 
Lanny Minnelli is actually also the voice of many different characters like this one and that one and that one and that one uh she's probably a part of your childhood and you don't even realize that's miss lanny minnelli while i personally do not agree with the change uh britney does an okay job all around as well uh there are many points where a bit more direction would have definitely helped her tremendously uh or even just one more take but the game is the way that it is. A lot has to do with the delivery of the lines in my opinion. Uh, Nancy was always very confident with what she said and sure of herself when she talked, but it didn't really feel like that in this game at times. She does remind you that Nancy is supposed to be 18 years old, whether that be uh, good or bad you can decide. The set pieces take a very large backseat in this game uh, due to the devs not being familiar with the engine. Uh, maybe only two or three set pieces being anywhere close to what the Nancy Drew brand had grown accustomed to. Puzzles were very forgettable and I only enjoyed the last puzzle of the game. Some of them felt like busy tasks or chores for other people. There's also a weird interaction on the phone with Ned uh, that implies that he's cheating that's never brought up again. Uh, I don't know if I missed the the call like you had to call him again at a certain point and he'll come up but the last part of the last time that you talk to Ned in game he's like jokingly giggling with another girl and is doing the whole like stop it stop it thing so and it's very strange because it, it's never touched on again they never mention anything about it again so is Ned just cheating now is he a cheater is that like are you trying to say that he's been cheating this whole time I don't know what to to gain out of that. Oh yeah, the uh, the Hardy Boys are here again. But like I said, uh, most of the game is okay. Fans really dogpiled it due to all the pent up anger that they had towards her interactive from the time jump that it took from 2015 to 2019 to release this game. It, I could be even wrong about that. I'm not going to go all the way back because I am lazy. Sorry whatever it was you look back and tell me editor justin will do it and i honestly can't help but feel a little bit bad for midnight in salem um i would probably give it middle of the road c it is an okay game so uh there you have it that is my ranking of the 33 mainline nancy drew games the 34th game is still in the works and has recently been teased Mystery of the Seven Keys will be set in Prague and is still on the Unity engine, so I guess we'll just have to see how that goes. Let me know what you agree with, what you disagree with, uh, down in the comments, because I would love to hear it. Thank you again so much for all the support on the last video. It means the world to me. I really enjoyed making it, and I hope you guys enjoyed watching it. Um, and yeah, I have been streaming recently on Twitch. I have Overwatch every once in a while. Come over and pop in if you want to see some gaming. And if you maybe want to play together or something, just let me know. Um, but yeah, everything will be linked in the description. Uh, all my sources for all this will be linked in the description. I appreciate everything. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. like green screen nancy right here she's my honey she's probably taller than me secret of the heart mm. <laughs> secret of the sc <laughs> you've been invited out by linden you've been invited out by linda pivot pevelin pinvelin 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 am i even ranking am i even ranking these anymore or am i just talking or am i just excitedly talking You've been invited out by Linda Pim Pimbalin. Pimbalin, Linda Pimbalin. But upon arriving to her Ryukin, she finds out that a supposed Yuri is haunting the ghost. The guests, the ghost, they're haunting the ghost. The Yuri's haunting the ghost. You've been invited out by Linda Pimbalin. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, just say the name. Nancy travels to Kyoto, Japan, and I've up already.